far as the uh, entire field of genetics, medical genetics in India is concerned, is in nascency. Absolutely, both in clinical practice as well as research, uh, very little is there, both in terms of clinical genetics as well as laboratory genetics for genetic diagnostic disorders. And we have not really experienced uh, so much of uh, ethical legal problems, uh, except for uh, one of the major problems that I shared with you was a question of sharing the uh, wife's uh, status uh, with the family, uh, where uh, the husbands have threatened for divorce. That kind of thing uh, has been a practical uh, uh, problem uh, in uh, our milieu, which is uh, needs worth considering what kind of. And so, although theoretically it is a dictum always that the counseling should be done with the couple and with the family, uh, a couple and a witness. The general traditional practice of counseling is the counseling should be done with both couples being present. But when we feel that the dis uh, disclosure of the wife's status make the uh, consequential problem, we have stopped uh, expressing the wife's uh, uh, potential or career status in terms of transmitting disease. And uh, we counsel wife separately and husband separately, then together. And so that is a kind of a thing which is by practice. We have published it. And we have tried to sensitize the Indian uh, fraternity as well as uh, international fraternity that uh, this situation in certain uh, uh, milieus, social context needs to be viewed uh, with caution. But at the present time, uh, realizing all that what we have discussed, the ICMR, when it was revising its guidelines in 2000, even at that time, uh, they uh, have incorporated a special chapter on the ethical issues related to uh, practice and research in field of uh, genetics. So uh, at least uh, we can say ourselves that we are current, we are um, uh, as international as uh, anywhere else in the world as far as recognition of the various issues related to uh, ethical issues related to the practice of genetics are there. And most of the things which I mentioned in my earlier talk are uh, uh, indicated in this um, uh, statement of specific principles, which has been revised in 2006. But uh, still, it has a status of guidelines, ICMR guidelines. It doesn't have a statutory status per se. I don't know what is happening lately. I know Vasanta and Nami is here. Uh, they are trying very hard to uh, make it a legislation. It must be in the pipeline in some stages. Uh, sooner or later, it will come up as a. Uh, but it would not be separate in relation to genetics. It would be part and parcel of the entire biomedical research. Uh, and within that, there would be one chapter on the uh, special aspect of uh, genetics. So in India, this is implemented. It is required to be implemented, these guidelines, by institutional ethics committees. But if the institutional ethics committees, they, if they have any problem, they can refer the matters, contentious matters, uh, to the central ethics committee uh, of the ICMR. Uh, which can uh, look into these uh, kind of problems. But I don't think that I have seen any problem being referred to uh, Central Committee uh, till this date uh, of this nature uh, from the country. And uh, in India, as uh, and we, uh, we believe in the, uh, having uh, plenty of everything, so uh, there are not only one set of guidelines, we have two sets of guidelines. So one set of guidelines is part of the ICMR guidelines. And the second set of guidelines is from the Department of Biotechnology, uh, which is under the heading of Ethical Policies on Human Genome and Genetic Research uh, Services. Uh, now this, uh, uh, essentially, the UNESCO in uh, uh, 1997 uh, has come out with this universal declaration on human genome and human rights. And as a part of the human genome and human rights, uh, it was required that there should be a national bioethics committee. Uh, there is a one international bioethics committee of the UNESCO in Paris, and there has to be national bioethics committees. So the government of India has constituted a national bioethics committee in the Department of Biotechnology to look into the various requirements for implementation of the guidelines, the UNESCO guidelines. Subsequently, UNESCO has come out with two other guidelines. Uh, one is a, a, uh, uh, the uh, international declaration on human genetic data. That is the one which talks largely about the genetic testing, genetic. Uh, and one of the important problems with reference to genetic testing is the question of test being done on a stored material. I'll come with some examples. Uh, here you'll find that if the person is dead and the DNA material is, cannot be obtained for making a diagnosis, then whether or not the stored material can be used uh, for purpose of make, making genetic diagnosis, for those guidelines have to be evolved. And then there is another third one 
which is a universal declaration on bioethics and human rights. This uh, universal declaration on bioethics and human rights is not related to genetics, it is general. Okay. So, these are the three international WHO, UNESCO declarations, which at a, as of date govern most of the basic principles related to uh, issues of bioethics. And, uh, but in particular, which are important are this, the human genome and human rights. The major contribution of this human genome, human rights is to say it is a double-edged uh, kind of a declaration. It says that uh, genetic material is a, uh, is a world heritage. So, if it is a world heritage, then your DNA is my DNA and my DNA is your DNA. Okay. And, uh, so, when it comes to uh, uh, making profit from your DNA, it is my DNA. And so, that is how uh, uh, the things stand uh, as of uh, present. But, and there has been a lot of debate. It has talked about, uh, it has hinted that the genetic material should not be uh, patented. But there has been a lot of controversy regarding the patenting of genetic material. And finally, uh, there was a time, uh, normally for uh, patenting, two things are required. There should be innovation. Innovation means that you should, one should do something to, it should not be existing. Discovery is not patented. It is the, uh, in, uh, it's the uh, uh, once, once you uh, develop something new, then it can be patented. But along with that, it is also important that it should be of use. If it is not of utility, then again there is no patent. So, uh, a, a innovation with novelty, which utility is patentable. So, plain DNA sequences are not patentable. But if you say that the patent, this DNA sequence has this potential of utility, then it becomes with utility. A, a, a DNA sequence without known function is not patentable. DNA function, DNA sequence with known function is patentable. And if you have mortar, uh, uh, modified it in some way, if you have cloned it somewhere, if you have overexpressed it, if you have made some product out of it, then it becomes patentable. So, uh, by far, uh, so from that point of view, a large number of processes which are there related to making DNA, they are patented. The DNA sequence may not be patented, but various other tests are. Uh, DNA as such should not be patentable. But if this can be used for human good, the countries are free to think about what processes can be evolved for patenting. So, this is the inherent that is a philosophy, it, is, it has been accepted by all the nations of the world. It is a UN General Assembly which has adopted it. So, we may agree or we may not agree unless we persuade the UN General Assembly to change its uh, uh, version, the uh, human DNA uh, uh, is open to patenting. It is not completely uh, banned from uh, patenting, but it is still subject to the question that uh, the, when the NIH uh, filed lots of patents. Uh, for the uh, sequences which were not knowing even function, then those that uh, uh, those claims were not uh, upheld and they were rejected. But subsequently, with the uh, 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 now assignment of functions to most of the DNA, uh, those D D genes have been patented. Lots of sequences have been patented. But even besides the lots of sequences being patented, the processes by which those sequences are made are the DNA is made. That is patented. For example, fish, the fluorescent in situ hybridization. For a fluorescent in situ hybridization, to get the best results, one of the first things that you have to do is you have to block the metaphase for non specific uh, um, uh, DNA binding by using a, a salmon, uh, it is a fish DNA. So, that fish DNA is used to block the non specific binding. So, that process is patented. And as a result, the entire fish industry. The fish probes come only from vices, no other company. And it is a huge cost of the vices probes because of that patent. So, what I am saying is that patent in this field is a very complex issue. It is not only related to DNA sequences, it is also related to processes. That one of the yellow rice which has been produced, which is rich in vitamin A, and that technology of making that rice has used more than 150 patents. So, there is a fight in licenses that which company will have a royalty share of how much for that particular variety. And so, in India, these are the two sets of guidelines which, uh, which have given directions uh, regarding the uh, various things to be followed uh, for research. And most of the things, as I have mentioned, 
to make simple things stay as simple as possible. It is a question of genetic information, basically the knowledge gained by gene, DNA tests, genetic tests and the potential of this genetic information, genetic knowledge to be used for discrimination. So, largely everything revolves around that we should not do anything, the information should remain confidential, private and it should not jeopardize the interests of the individual, should not stigmatize the individual and should not uh, put the person to harm by discrimination. That is a goal. That's a golden principle of all the guidelines with reference to DNA practice of uh, medical genetics and the research in uh, genetics. Both these guidelines, they are in consonance with WHO's international guidelines on ethical issues in medical genetics and they also draw on uh, the, 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 this body, Newfield Council on Bioethics has deliberated a whole lot on issues related to genetics. And this particular uh, site I will recommend to you, this, uh, w, uh, this uh, uh, WHO International INT Genomics LC ELSI Oblique Resources. So, most of the information related to LC issues, uh, international LC issues resources uh, in WHO are available through this uh, site. In India, there is another act which is very important is the prenatal diagnosis of sex. And this prenatal diagnostic techniques act provides for every genetic clinic what facility should be there what records it should keep and without the recognition registration by the uh, state you can't do it so no person can uh, uh, a person no, uh, nobody can practice medical genetics without registration uh, so this uh, uh, the main provision of this is that the uh, uh, no test should be done to find out the fetal sex and no fetal sex should be um, uh, revealed and if the fetal sex is revealed then that uh, what would be the punishments for the uh, both doctors as well as the family which is seeking uh, for it. So, this is the Indian scenario. Indian scenario there are only these three things guidelines of ICMR, guidelines of DBT and the prenatal diagnostic techniques act. In India there is no protection against the uh, genetic diagnosis by insurance or for employment. As a matter of fact, one of the countries which is most advanced thinking in this direction, most of the problems related to genetic disorders and allowing for even large number of uh, clinical experimental studies is UK. The UK laws are most progressive, uh, both in terms of restricting and permitting the what should be done, what should not be done, if it is to be done, how it should be done to ensure protection for the people. And the uh, UK, the uh, Genetics Advisory Commission of UK in 2001 has recommended a moratorium on genetic testing by insurance companies. The insurance company cannot order, they get a genetic test done before getting an insurance. Because they said up until this time we do not know the utility, knowledge, limitations, uh, advantages, disadvantages, harmful effects and so let us, that is why let us agree to declare a moratorium. Okay? It is not a final solution. We will see how things evolve. The, you see here there is it is a double edged weapon. If a person with a genetic disorder requires a lot of medical expense which an insurance company has to pay, then who is going to pay the bill for that medical insurance? It is the normal healthy people those who do not have a genetic trait. So, the burden has to be then passed on distributed to everybody equally or else to be loaded specifically for the persons those who are carrying the trait. So, the um, so insurance company also cannot make money to uh, provide for services. This was initially started in 2001 for 5 years that is 2006 then it is again extended for 5 years to 2011. So, it is still in limbo we do not know here this way or that. And the main thing is that there is no significant predictive ability of genetic tests at the moment to allow for accurate risk assessment. This is mainly for polygenic multifactorial disorders. When we are talking of genetic susceptibility when we are talking single gene disorders, then this statement does not hold valid. Single gene determined disorders, if there is an abnormal gene, that person is going to have a disease. If it is autosomal recessive, when it is homozygote, if it is autosomal dominant in the heterozygote state. But for complex polygenic multifactorial disorders, we do not know a particular genetic makeup will definitely give rise to disease or will not give rise to disease. Even for BRCA1, BRCA2 positive, the risk of developing breast cancer is varies from 37 to 86 percent by the age of 70 years. So, the range is 37 to 86 percent. So, whether or not BRCA1 positive will give rise to breast cancer cannot be absolutely predicted. So, that is why 
the recommendation has been that at this state of art, what we are knowing, we do not know enough and let there be a moratorium. But it says that increased collaboration between industry and science are required to improve knowledge of actuarial implications of genetic factors. This is the major recommendation that if there is a genetic trait, if there are genes which are predisposing, then what are its actual risks? Let it be investigated, scientifically proved, established, then we will think about it, now what can be done. And the insurance companies, this is the association of British insurers, and the British insurers have agreed that insurance companies will not insist on genetic test. Okay? And genetic tests will only affect insurance if they show a clearly increased risk of illness or death. Just as I said, for single gene disorders, if they show increased risk, then it will uh, affect, otherwise it will not affect. Okay? A low increase in risk will not necessarily be a, a, add to a premium. And they also agreed that existing test results need not be disclosed. And new mortgage of house purchase up to 500,000 pounds, the person can still take a life insurance and uh, will not have to get a genetic test done, even with the with the previous genetic test. An applicant will not be required to disclose the results of genetic tests undertaken by any other person. And you see, this is what is going to happen. The insurance company can ask that in any in your family, if anybody else has got the test done, what is the result? And one of the clause in all insurance companies is that if you will hide any information and if it is proved later on that you have hidden the information, there would be no insurance coverage. So you can't just simply say that you didn't, uh, you didn't know, you didn't disclose. At the present time, this is what I found, the two most important recommendations from the UK, which are there on card for us to consider them as a role model with reference to the uh, potential position ca that can be taken with reference to insurance. And in US, United States, now there is a bill, 2007, which is a Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, that on basis of genetic information, there should be no discrimination, both with reference to insurance and employment. This is pending. This is still under active consideration of the US Congress. And that can serve as a role model with reference to what can be done for uh, providing protection against uh, uh, genetic traits with reference to insurance and employment. And the US has passed another act that all genetic information will be kept confidential and private. A special law for keeping genetic information confidential and private. And that is called Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act 1996. And this prohibits that no part of the medical record can be used for research of a person without the permission of that individual. Okay. And it also provides that all the information regarding genetic tests must be, uh, this is the authorization for use or disclosure, that according to that act, everything is prohibited. If you want to do anything, then you have to take the authorization from the uh, person for any one of these acti activities, which would be specific, time bound, written, and so on, and for what purpose, which would be defined, then you can use that information. And the information should be anonymized. It has provided information, uh, uh, the uh, advice and guidance that how the sample will be totally de-anonymized. Sample would be dissociated from the personal identity of the individual. So all the details regarding anonymization are available in that uh, act. And there is also a thinking which is going on regarding regulation of genetic testing. And there the Newfield Foundation has been most active. And the areas for regulation which are being considered, still there is no act which is regulating. But for regulation of genetic testing, these are the areas that are being thought of. And when a comprehensive bill comes re with reference to genetic testing, that, will that may include these things. Quality of the test kit. The, in the United States, it is already there. The, any test DNA kit, if a doctor uses, if it is for research purpose, then it is different. If it is for service, then the test must be done by an FDA approved kit. If the kit is not approved by FDA, its result cannot be used. Okay? So this is a requirement for a DNA diagnostic test for service. That it should be used FDA approved kit. Also the laboratories, they should be approved under the CLIA, which is a Clinical Laboratory Improvement Amendment. If the laboratory is not a, uh, CLIA approved, then again it cannot do a genetic test. And quality assurance uh, guidelines are there from CDC Atlanta. And 
uh, special applications, the pre-implantation genetic diagnosis newborn that requires to be regulated. And that this is the an area which is a part of great concern. The uh, direct consumer marketing, what is going on now is that because DNA diagnostic tests, they would have, they are expensive, they have money. And so the manufacturers are interested in directly promoting them. So just like as the new fad which has come in, they store your umbilical cord blood for next generation. DNA banking, the cell banking. Okay? So it's a direct advertisement. Nobody goes and to consult a doctor whether or not I should get an umbilical cord blood uh, stored or not. Okay? So likewise here, there is an advertisement from the firms <coughs> that here is a test. It will tell you, for example, BRCA1, BRCA2, risk for cancer. So you get yourself tested. And then as a part of a gimmick, they have said that you first will have to mail us your history. We will do a telephone conversation, give you counseling. Then you send a throat swab in the sample that has been provided and we will send you the result. And we'll again counsel you. So they have taken care of providing counseling, but counseling on phone, which cannot replace the effective face-to-face -face, uh, counseling. Of, I told you all the uh, things which are required in terms of counseling, which is necessary. And uh, United States, 1998, the, uh, the, uh, the government has constituted an advisory committee on genetic testing. It, recommendations are not yet out. So there is a lot of thinking which is going on in terms of how to regulate genetic testing and genetic screening, but that during course of time will emerge. The WHO has laid down some guidelines with reference to screening programs. That for using a genetic test for screening purposes, what kind of general guidelines can be followed? Okay. And most important thing is that for whatsoever purpose you are applying a screening test, you must have a good knowledge of the disease. You should know about its health problems, you should uh, know how it can be diagnosed uh, early, and you should, most important is, you should know about the natural history of the disease. You should know, have full knowledge of the test, its suitability for examination, acceptability for population, and uh, continued case uh, finding, uh, it should be uh, carried out. And treatment of the disease and cost consideration. The main dictum is that no screening should be done where there is no intervention possible. If there is no intervention available, if there is no treatment available, there is no use of screening. Screening should be done only when the intervention is available. And it is cost effective. It's not only that the intervention is available and you will have to sell your house to get the treatment. So uh, uh, what is the use of that situation? So uh, the cost considerations are also important. Availability treatment is also important. And it should be available only for those diseases which are incurable, intreatable, and bad prognosis, heavy burden, likely to lead to death, and uh, um, badly affecting quality of life then yes. If it is a mild trivial thing, then why go for a screening and testing? Okay. So those are the general guidelines and principles which are there. And one of the most important areas where it has been allowed that you can do screening without any consent, without any prior information is the newborn screening. One of the most important revolutionary things which has happened in the field of medical genetics is screen the newborn for a genetic defect and start an intervention so that the child develops normally. The two examples are phenylketonuria and hypothyroidism. The, although the prevalence of phenylketonuria is 1 in 15,000 births, but a child with phenylketonuria will be mentally retarded, will live in the uh, mental institution all life. But if you diagnose phenylketonuria at the time of birth, within first to six to seven days, and you eliminate phenylalanine from the diet, you give phenylalanine free diet, the child will develop absolutely normally, will become adult, will marry, can have children. Uh, it is there since 1950s, almost 40, 50 years. So it's tried, tested, experimented in life. And so United States, several states have passed a law that all newborns should be screened for phenylketonuria. And th those programs are nationally funded. And they say if one child with phenylketonuria uh, lives normal life, then the investment in detecting that child by screening 15,000 people is paid. What the state will have to spend on the care of the affected child, compared to that, the money spent on screening will be better than as compared to taking care of a sick child. Likewise, 
neonatal hypothyroidism. In neonatal hypothyroidism, the prevalence may be even quite high. In India, perhaps it's considered to be one of the highest, maybe even of the order of one in 1800 to one in 3000. So out of 3000 children, if one child is going to suffer from hypothyroidism, when you give thyroxine, child becomes normal, it would be a big change. So here the benefit outweighs autonomy. Beneficence outweighs autonomy. And so, the, uh, although of course you inform the parents, you take their uh, consent if it is possible, you give them brochures, you educate them, and if they st have a specific objection, then you can consider not doing a test, but otherwise there is no need for taking consent for neonatal screen. Now I will share with you some of the ethical dilemmas, practical examples, clinical case examples, which will illustrate to you that what are the issues with reference to ethics in relation to medical genetics. Here is a case history of a 30 year old woman whose mother developed breast cancer when she was 39 and died from the condition three years later. B knows that her aunt, her late mother sister was also diagnosed with breast cancer sometimes in her 30s and had mastectomy. A is still alive but she and B are estranged. This is the United States, probably in India too, it may happen, okay? So now the tissue blocks from her late mother are not available and her aunt puts the phone down when she rings and does not reply to her letters. So now how B to get help? Whether or not the aunt, there is a aunt had cancer, mother had cancer, two family members, first degree relatives have breast cancer, at young age, below 40 years of age. So if two first degree family members have cancer below 40 years of age, there is a high risk probability for this individual also to suffer from breast cancer. There is a high possibility that the parent might have been BRCA1, BRCA2 positive. So if they were BRCA1 positive, and if she's also BRCA positive, then she can follow a particular course of action. But if the aunt refuses to let her sample be used, then what are the options? I'm, I don't have a solution. Neither, these are the kinds of things for which the ethics committees may even have to find a practice. The ethics in relation to medical genetics is not limited to research. The ethic, role of ethics committee is not related to research. The role of ethics committees, as a matter of fact, in the United States, some universities have departments of bioethics and they have a residency program. So if you have a difficult case, you refer to the ethics department for consultation, for counseling, and then see the what in that given case should be done. What are the various issues, pros and cons, and what is right, what should be done. Basic point that I am trying to say is, you can't use a stored material without consent. A stored material is of the aunt. A stored material is not of the hospital. A stored material, for using the stored material, you have to take consent. And as I have given you guidelines that if the family member refuses to share information, then those principles which are written, they have to be followed to see that whether the aunt's autonomy can be overridden by the beneficence to the other individual. So general principles will remain the same. Autonomy, beneficence, justice. Using those principles, you will have to look and judge of the entire situation. What should be done in that case? Here B is a woman whose brother A had suffered from Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Okay? So sister of an affected male is likely to be carrier, 50% chance for sister to be carrier. B is planning a family and would not wish to have son with this condition. If B is a carrier, then there is a 50% chance that her son would be affected. So if B is 50% risk of carrier, then her son 50% risk means overall 25% risk of her son to be a carrier. So now A had a muscle biopsy sample taken when he was a child. The tissue was stored, but DNA was not extracted or tested using molecular laboratory methods. In the meanwhile, A has died. What can be done? The problem is that the mutation of Duchenne muscular dystrophy, it becomes easier to find if in the affected sample you know what is the mutation, then you can test easily. If you don't have an affected sample, then to know what is the mutation which is giving rise to disease becomes difficult. So for giving diagnosis, very often you need a material from the affected individual. Okay? So here, the, but these are the simple issues which can still be resolved, there are no problems, but these are the issues which need to be looked into and to resolve. B is a young man whose father A has progressive neurodegenerative disorder, maybe Huntington's chorea. 
B has not had a good relationship with his father for five years since he left home because of his father's outbursts. Both his parents died young. The father's parents, grandparents have died. Father is uh, uh, suffering from a disease and the offspring and father are not in talking terms. Now what is the issue? The B and his wife wish to have a family but V does not wish to have a family if the same neurodegenerative condition is passed as the father. And he wants to have a genetic predictive test. And in this case, the son may even not like to know whether he has got an increased risk or not. He only wants that his child should not be affected. Okay? And, but father refuses to get a, get a sample. So his father had a tissue biopsy taken surgery eight years ago. What can be done? Again, issues are all related to stored materials. All three examples are of stored material, how to use. The next examples are in relation to application for insurance. Beth is a 24-year-old girl who has got her first job. These are life situations. These are, I've taken from literature. I have not changed names uh, because the faces are not there. I should have probably camouflaged when the name is there. I should have probably said A or B as part of ethical practice, the name should not be disclosed. But here is a life situation that a 24-year-old girl got her first job. She has a strong family history of breast ovary cancer on her mother's side. Mother having breast cancer at age 27 years, maternal grandmother having bilateral breast cancer at age 42 and 55 years. And so there is one thing I said, breast cancer at early age. The second is a bilateral breast cancer. These are the ones which are more likely to be hereditary. And Beth's mother has undergone BRCA1 testing and is found to be positive for a mutation known to be associated with breast cancer. The insurance form provided to her the form for answers. What should she answer? Okay. So in this case, the mother has got tested. Mother was BRCA1 positive. There is a strong family history. And now the insurance company is, she has got a new job. So as a part of a new job, she has to fill a form for insurance. And this form then as a part of this study, they found that out of 21 companies which provide insurance, almost all companies ask for some information regarding family history. 21 out of 21, 10 out of 21, 10 out of 21, 20 out of 21 and so on. How many companies ask for this information? The numerator represents those number of companies and denominator is 21 companies whose forms is part of a routine thing. But you know how much searching the questions can be. The questions can be, the personal history of cancer is a general question. I have kept it in blue. It's not that important. But look at this. All the brown ones are the loaded questions. Brown ones are loaded questions. Okay. The first degree relates with cancer. Cancer in extended family, ever had genetic testing. Genetic testing resulted in a family member and duty of disclosure. Every, every sample says, if you will not disclose, then the, all the benefits would go. So she knows her mother was BRCA1 positive. Should she write she is BRCA1 positive? Her mother was BRCA1 positive. Of course, the family history she will give. But if the mother was BRCA1 positive, the daughter is 50% likely to have BRCA1 positive. So if she has 50% positivity and the risk is 37 to 76%, so even then the risk is of 30% of, uh, sorry, 16%, uh, 18% of her developing breast cancer compared to general population of about 12%. So what would the insurance company take care of this information? So even though at the present time, genetic testing is not compulsory by the insurance companies, tomorrow the genetic testing can be made compulsory by companies. And if as a result of it, either the premiums are loaded or the policies are denied, then it's social implications. And that's why the need for national laws. And that's why in the US the bill for what should be the policy for genetic non-discrimination. And so the only thing is what I can say is that I hope the guidelines of the ICMR become a law as early as possible. And perhaps the ICMR should then think of the second stage of bringing in laws related to genetic non-discrimination. That is a very important need, which we are still totally oblivious. And it is better that we wake up sooner than later. The two other sensitive areas what is the genetic testing for children? And one of the most important things in relation to children is that you should not test the child on the parent's instructions, parent's wishes. 
even though parent is a legal guardian, but parent cannot always claim to be the best person to protect the interest of the child, unless the test is of direct relevance to the child. One example I have given is Mentue. It's a familial um, endocrine neoplasia in which the child develops uh, carcinoma of the thyroid at the age of six months, one year, two years. At that time, the child can, cannot say yes or no at all. And in that child, if you do the test and the test is positive, then thyroidectomy is recommended after one year of age, even before the cancer occurs. Prophylactic thyroidectomy. The prophylactic thyroidectomy takes away the risk of thyroid cancer. And normally, people wait for the thyroid cancer to appear, then operate, then the prognosis becomes too bad. There was a time when there was a pentagastrin stimulation test. All persons were put to pentagastrin stimulation test, which is itself uh, difficult and could be toxic. But if by DNA diagnostic test, 100% sure you can find, and this is a gene which is almost 100% penetrant, so if the individual has uh, mutation, then likely to develop, 100% likely to develop disease, and a prophylactic thyroidectomy can be done. So in those cases, yes, the child can be tested. But otherwise, wait till the child becomes uh, uh, old enough to consent. In the states, is 16 years for treatment, age of consent, for treatment 16 years. Ascent can be by age of seven years. Somebody was talking about rule of seven. And uh, newborn screening uh, as a special status, which I've already told you. And the other is this loaded issue of screening for, I told you loaded issue of insurance also. If, you, if the insurance companies don't give a higher premium or don't deny insurance, then they can't protect everybody else at the, at the economic rates. Here, workplace, the employer says, if I know that you are predisposed to a toxic effect of the chemical in my factory, I will put you at some other place so that you are not exposed. So I am getting this test done for your benefit. So for your benefit, the testing is all right. But if he says that because you are positive, that's why I will not employ you, then it is using the same thing for a wrong purpose. And likewise, if a person from sickle cell anemia, thalassemia carrier, is, wants to become a pilot, and it develops during hypoxia, a um, hypoxemic crisis, and uh, makes the plane crash, the, all the people, those who are flying, they will be gone. So the, the airline says that we would like to screen everybody whether or not they are thalassemic sickle cell carriers. Maybe right, it will be for the protection of everybody else. But if they say that because you are positive, you will not give you a job, then so it's a double-edged weapon screening of people working at workplace. What is right to be done, what is not right to be done. And again, for that, the law has to be there. Okay? In the United States, there is a law of Workmen uh, Disability Act. But uh, again, the, these are the two issues which have been always bothering me. And I am taking this opportunity to sensitize ICMA to think about uh, a, uh, at least sensitizing the government that this, these kind of issues are bound to come in, crop in, in our milieu as well. And what should be our policy with reference to uh, discrimination on genetic acts. This is just a conclusion slide. All the issues that I talked of, the genetic testing and uh, uh, screening. Uh, I was also talking about the ownership of biological samples, patenting of DNA sequences, uh, which we were discussing, and uh, uh, somatic cell gene therapy, germline gene therapy, and gene therapy for enhancement, and uh, um, uh, therapeutic cloning and reproductive cloning. All these in the book which has been given to you by ICMR, it is in a table form. For these issues, what are the potential harms and what are the remedies? They are given in the book that uh, has been. Okay, so I will stop. I have taken too much time. <laughs>